dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to have the opportunity to speak to you. And although I cannot be with you in person, I hope that the thoughts I'm going to talk about will be of some interest for you. Of course, I hope that you personally and your university have survived the pandemic so far without any greater problems. And um, um, the reason why I'm talking about identity and community today is of course linked to the pandemic and to the question how our university is actually reacted to this pandemic and how they will have to rebuild the university uh, once this pandemic will hopefully be over. What I'm going to talk to about today is a crisis of communication. And uh, I think that this is a topic that has not attracted too much attention up to now, but which will attract our attention in the future. So what do I mean to say if I sp uh, speak about communication in crisis? I think we can more or less say that most universities managed to sustain research and teaching activities during the corona pandemic. And that from this point of view, we can be very proud and happy that we have been going through this crisis with quite some success. However, I think, and this not only draws onto my uh, experiences at the University of Vienna, but also uh, onto many, many conversations I had with um, uh, colleagues from other universities. Um, during this crisis, one problem has been arising, and this is a communication problem. What kind of communication problem are we confronted with? It's a, a problem of communication among the university leadership, uh, between the university leadership and the researchers, the students and the administration, and of course also among the researchers and among the students. And um, while most of us have learned to use uh, Zoom as a tool to overcome the problem of communication, uh, we must admit that Zoom meetings do not easily replace face-to-face -face meeting and that we are lacking informal meetings as well as discussions um, that actually sort of informally um, relate to very urgent issues such as the ongoing transformation process inside the universities. And of course, we have also lacking opportunities uh, in discussing all kinds of issues beyond institutional barriers which is um, between faculties, between researchers from different uh, departments in the universities, and of course, also a communication with our students. Um, this implies that the very, very important communication flow between the university leadership and the researchers, students, and the members of the administrative staff um, have been uh, reduced to a minimum. And uh, I, one could even say that because of this problem of communication, um, the university leadership tends to be nearly invisible. So is the crisis of communication a crisis of leadership? To a certain degree, I think we have to understand that no matter whether we are in a situation of crisis or not, whether we are in a pandemic or not, university leaderships have a precarious legitimacy. This is the consequence of the way we actually elect or do not elect university leaderships, uh, the way university leaderships are being appointed. So they cannot draw onto a normal democratic selection and election process. And for that reason, once a university leadership has been installed for a certain period of time, it is the task of this leadership to prove that actually uh, they are the legitimate leaders of the university. They have to show that they can do it. And of course, under normal conditions, university leaders use the communication with the researchers, with other 
um, uh, sort of department leaders in the universities, and of course also uh, with the administrative staff to show that they know how to lead the university. However, if this communication is being interrupted, um, it will not only have a consequence on the communication between the top leadership and other echelons of the university administration, it will also have a consequence for communication flows at the middle and low levels of the university because they will imitate the central leadership, the top leadership in the way they communicate with their people. And we can, I think, come to the conclusion that if the vertical communication stops, the horizontal communication will not necessarily replace it. And this means that the communication is reduced to a minimum and it is very difficult for leaderships inside the university, be they at the top level or at the middle level or at the grassroots level, to actually show that they know how to lead the university. And in this sense, a crisis of communication is a crisis of leadership, no matter how you go about um, this problem. So why is uh, a crisis of communication also a problem that is related to community and identity? Um, according to my assessment of the situation, one could say that if a university loses its vertical and horizontal communication structure, it loses its capacity to build community inside the university and uh, this implies that the university as a community of a special group of people with a special sense of mission is actually uh, entering a crisis situation. And this crisis is a crisis of community, uh, of identity, because a university that loses its sense of community that loses its sense of a special mission that it has to fulfill is a university without identity. You know that we are discussing the problem of identity, not only inside universities, but as a general problem of our societies. And maybe in society, we see more clearly than inside the university that a crisis of identity inside um, society actually generates quite a lot of problems with regard to the inner fabric of the community, which we call society. And this I think is also, or might also be true for universities. The consequence of um, a crisis of communication is that uh, we actually have a situation of atomization among the members of the university. And this loss of cohesion um, generates uh, a problem because it reduces the sense of responsibility of the individual for the institution as such, and it reduces motivation. And in our case, this always means it reduces productivity. It generates a tendency of evasion and a tendency towards a retreat into privacy. So uh, all the measures we have been taking in the past to actually generate more cohesion, to generate responsibility, to foster motivation and productivity are sort of um, uh, reduced. And the danger is that the tendency of evasion, the tendency we sometimes call early retirement at the age of 40, um, which means you still work at your university, but you, you actually don't identify with your, your university. You don't have a feeling of responsibility towards your university. This is a tendency that has grown enormously uh, since the <laughs> Okay, something fell down, I don't know. Are we having a little earthquake in, in Vienna or not? I am so sorry about this, but uh, I hope it didn't um, make it impossible for my argument to come across. So I'm just summarizing my last few words saying 
that uh, the atomization of all members of, of the university generates a loss of cohesion, um, a sense of um, distrust and loss of responsibility. It reduces motivation and productivity and generates a tendency towards evasion and a retreat into privacy. And we know from our experiences with all kinds of virtual communication tools that uh, Zoom meetings, for example, generate all kinds of cheating and as if behavior. We know that students pretend to be attending a course, although they are actually playing on their computers. We know that researchers are pretending to be present at the meeting, although they are lying on their bed and taking a nap. We know that people from all groups in the university um, develop the habit of telling each other that, sorry, I didn't see your message, when they didn't want to answer to your message or when they thought that answering the message is a very difficult thing to do. So this is sort of the very, very obvious sign of how people sort of retreat into privacy, retreat into their way of doing things without relating to the university as an institution as a whole. So if we compare crisis management and management of the crisis, I think we can say that most university leaderships uh, around the world actually um, managed the crisis caused by the pandemic uh, in due time. And they did this by adapting the general rules defined by the states in which they live and work to the situation in their respective universities. And especially universities which were well acquainted and equipped with digital teaching tools rapidly changed from in classroom teaching to online teaching and thus uh, sort of continue to fulfill their task uh, uh, even under pandemic uh, conditions. Um, the home office situation, as a matter of fact, is not such a very, very um, uncommon situation for researchers at universities. We very often go to our home offices to write papers. And we very often go to our home offices when we want to read books and texts very intensively. And for that reason, I don't think that there are too many researchers at the university who did not know how to deal with the uh, home office situation. However, of course, um, while we sort of maybe even welcomed the fact that we could retreat from the uh, everyday business uh, into our home offices to write papers and books we would have liked to write and finalize for a long time, one must say that under pandemic conditions, of course, the home office situation uh, has been very different from usual home office situations as uh, many of us had to manage family and job simultaneously. And this of course has been an enormous challenge. Um, I think that um, this is something we really have to keep in mind, especially when we look at the productivity of our colleagues during pandemic times that taking over family duties because kindergarten and schools were closed is uh, something that is not relevant to your productivity. But all in all, I would say that the crisis management has been quite successful. However, the management of a more fundamental crisis, a crisis of community and identity has, according to my observation, so far not been dealt with. And as a matter of fact, and as I said earlier on, uh, I would say that this is actually a crisis that has not attracted our attention yet. So if we look at top-down management as one way of dealing with crisis, we can say that uh, the top-down management was very successful, especially in the incipient phase of the crisis when all members of the university lived in a state of uncertainty and they welcomed the top-down approach as a way to receive straight answers to their questions and uh, as a way to find certainty in a situation uh, which they had never been through before and, and therefore sort of lacked experience they could draw onto. 
um, university leaders in this situation, most of them at least, showed uh, quite some initi uh, initiative and farsightedness. Uh, they sometimes even showed decisiveness. And while they were showing these um, ways of uh, dealing with the crisis, I think most members of the university would have answered the question, is your university leadership active and legitimate? They would have said, yes, the leadership is active. The leadership is legitimate. There were, of course, also some leaders who preferred a wait and see attitude, especially when they realized that uh, societal conflicts on the measures taken by the state uh, were growing. So they preferred uh, to wait and see whether or not these kind of conflicts would also spill over into the university. And um, uh, I would say that um, in these cases, especially in the initial phase of the crisis, if you asked universities under the leaders who preferred a wait and see attitude, well, the members of the universities would have been a little bit hesitant to give a straight positive answer uh, regarding the leadership um, capabilities of their rectors. Invisible leaders um, will have a hard time reestablishing their legitimacy once this crisis will have been over. Um, uh, especially um, people who are maybe not the rector, but vice rectors uh, who actually have a responsibility that even under normal conditions is not as visible as other vice rectors um, uh, duties. I think they will be confronted with a problem of people saying, you know, what did this guy or this woman actually do during our crisis? Did we see them? Did we know whether or not they took any decisions? No, we don't. These people were invisible. And if they were invisible during the crisis, they will have a hard time reestablishing their legitimacy. So how can we go about um, when we try to find a solution for the management of the crisis? So for the management of the crisis I was just talking about, which is the crisis of community and identity. And I think that there is a good solution that we might want to try, which is a participatory form of management. Um, and I think uh, this has already been existing in many universities. And for those who have already tried out participatory management, um, they can build on these experiences and develop them into new, um, <clears throat> into new areas of, um, of the university. And for those who have so far relied totally on top-down management, which some universities do, uh, I would advise them uh, to actually define certain areas where they can find out whether or not participatory management uh, will not only help them to run the university well, but also help them to overcome the crisis of community and identity. Um, I think that including as many people as possible into the post-crisis rebuilding of the university as a community of students, researchers, and administrative staff is a very, very urgent task. And the methodology of participatory management is a very good tool in overcoming the crisis of community and identity. And before I finalize my presentation, I would like to give you a few hints <clears throat> at uh, the uh, question where and in which areas we could actually try out uh, the style of participatory management uh, in order to overcome this crisis of community and identity. So one very easy way to do things would be to use your in-house expertise. I think many universities tend to overlook that a university is actually a natural reservoir of lots of expertise. And only to give you one example, you could encourage supervisors and students to write their BA and NA thesis related to the pros and cons of digital learning. I think that universities have learned a lot um, with regard to digital learning. And I think that uh, in future, we will have to assess 
what kind of digital learning will we continue even if this pandemic will have been over one day? So one area, for example, is the question of digital examinations. So many people have doubts about uh, digital ex examinations, but one way to actually assess whether or not digital examinations uh, are a good tool to, to, to examine the students would be to prepare, uh, to compare the results of digital examinations with the many, many data we have on non-digital um, examinations um, of the past and to see whether there is a major difference between the results of the digital examinations in comparison to non-digital uh, examinations. I personally switched to digital examinations at the beginning of the pandemic. I have been uh, looking through my data ever since, and I found out that I don't have any difference in results. So this would actually be one interesting argument in assessing whether or not we will be able and we should um, uh, give, um, uh, uh, sh uh, should use the tool of digital examinations also in the future. Um, another interesting uh, area where one could try out uh, participatory management is the question of home office. How do we deal with the question of home office in the future? <clears throat> and I think we could sort of think of an answer to this question by uh, organizing an open innovation process in which not only the institutions inside the university that usually uh, sort of discuss these issues, take decisions on these issues, are being included into the innovation process, but you could also allow for informal discussions and informal group to sit down <clears throat> and discuss their solutions to this problem and make some kind of competition, organize some kind of competition between different ways of looking at the home office uh, situation. And finally, even using our online tools to have everybody in the university cast a vote on this. Um, you can, of course, define that this vote will not be the final vote. It will be like a recommendation for the rector to take a final uh, decision, but you would be able to organize and um, motivate and mobilize lots and lots of people inside your university because this home office situation is something so many people are confronted with. I would assume that quite a lot of people are interested in participating in such a, um, a discussion. And last but not least, I think um, the pandemic uh, has shown that the communication is not only a communication inside the university, but also between experts from the university and the society. And I think that many people who had been sort of working in their labs for a long time were suddenly confronted with a demand from society and politics to actually interfere to voice their opinions, to participate in a political discussion. And I think I'm not the only person around uh, who says that maybe some of our colleagues were not well prepared for this kind of challenge and for this kind of uh, communication. So I think it would also be quite uh, important to think about the possibility to sort of use participatory management as a way of organizing a process of self-reflection among researchers with regard to responsibilities of researchers um, for providing expertise, for providing solutions for societal problems and conflicts. Um, I assume that uh, with things getting a little bit more difficult uh, in the future years to come, uh, the expertise of the university will be used more and more uh, and will there will be an enormous demand for researchers to actually voice their opinions in uh, in the public and I think uh, we have learned from this um, crisis that we need to prepare our researchers uh, for this kind of challenge so that they can do a better job. So I hope that I could uh, voice a few ideas about how to get back to normal at the university. And um, I hope that this is going to ignite uh, some discussion among you. I think it is 
very, very urgent that we discuss about these issues. And I think that LEAD2 is a very uh, important and interesting platform to um, conduct these discussions among uh, uh, university leaderships from all different uh, countries and all different universities. Thank you very much for your attention.